within the digital media space. 245 of them have been within the disruption by mobile space and 129 in IoT. So whether you're thinking as a Cisco partner or, or you're thinking as a Lufthansa partner, some of these startups have something to offer. Of course, by industry, this is the breakdown. Telecoms, business, tourism, healthcare, sports and entertainment, you know, uh, retail, manufacturing. We've been able to touch across a myriad of industries, and not only that, there's a lot of cross-pollination between these industries, which makes it very interesting for the ecosystem. Uh, at the, the stage of funding for many of these startups, over half of them you know, are, are just at seed funding or gone past seed funding. And then from Angel VC, we have about 31%, with about 16% of them being at Series A. Uh, fundraising, uh, you know, for, for some of them, Yes, 63% of them are interested in raising money. So for the VC in the room, uh, they'll be coming to you. And then, of course, some others are at various levels of their development where it could be strategic partnerships or it could be just kind of team building and business model validation that will get them to the next uh, round of opportunities. Uh, in terms of size, uh, this is what we're looking at from uh, the size of the companies that we've seen uh, through the competition. Uh, small, medium, large, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, certainly within a Barcelona sequence, some of them fall right in the range of what the average size of a Barcelona startup would look like. Uh, today, of course, we're going to have the same sequence uh, that we've had for the last three days. Uh, we'll have an esteemed panel of judges who will be coming on stage to kind of give a perspective on what their individual companies are doing within the startup ecosystem, particularly in helping growth startups. Uh, these companies are the companies you saw on the previous slide that are part of our growth partner network. But more importantly, these companies also have specific startup programs that they're running. So it's very important that uh, many of the startups in the room, whether you're participating or not, take advantage of, of the programs these companies have. And then for some of you, you might actually become part of an acquisition process. So it's, it's part of what we're doing here in positioning these startups very favorably in front of our growth partners. So without further ado, I want to invite our judges to the stage. Judges, if you could please, you know, from, from the right side of the room, uh, Anub Fashisht, please welcome him with a round of applause. He's one of our growth partners. <laughs> Christina Reeson from Evernote. All the way from Wales, we have Phil Sage from Hasbro. <laughs> Visiting us from Tokyo, we have James Chen. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Krishna from DFJ Esprit. I hope we have, a, we have a mic on the table. We're just going to pass the mic through. So to our judges, uh, I mean, first things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of our growth partner network. It's quite important for us that we have these partners as well because the corporate innovation program is something that we think to the average startup while they're looking for traction and going through the traditional means, we also have corporate partners like you that could support them uh, through growth programs that are directed to their particular industry. So, you know, starting from that side, I, I, would, I would first of all want to ask the generic question so that the folks in the room who don't know uh, can, can know what you do. Um, what is your company currently doing uh, in terms of its business, its industry? What do you currently do for, for startups? And then what trends are you seeing in your industry? So again, what does your company currently do in terms of it's, it's its own industry. What do you do for startups as a growth partner? And what trends are you seeing in your overall industry? 
Great. So uh, my name is James. I'm from a company called Rakuten. We're actually the largest uh, internet service company in Japan. Uh, but for the last five years, we've been actually growing you know, globally. So, but we are known to be uh, one of the top um, companies in Japan. Um, in terms of what we're doing with startups, uh, hopefully you've seen many announcements by Rakuten over the last three years you know, with a lot of large acquisitions. And many of them are actually startups that's been around for you know, one to maybe five years. Um, and the reason that's interesting for Rakuten is that our vision is to build ecosystems of uh, useful services for the different consumers out there. So in Japan, we have over 50 companies, or sorry, 50 different businesses uh, that we provide to the user. So we create this ecosystem where people like to join us and we impact um, many parts of their lives. So what that means for startup is that for different countries around the world, we actually are looking at any service. <laughs> so we're not very niche on a specific area. Uh, you know, we have travel, we have um, e-commerce, we have banking, we have uh, mobile loyalty platform, and on and on and on. So, um, so that's sort of where uh, Rakuten is and what we're looking for. Uh, in terms of the trends we see right now is that um, we really want to get into more engaged with the consumers. So of course, with our acquisition of Viber, uh, we are part of their daily lives for many people with the instant messaging app. But with the trend of um, going to more wearables, you know, there's other areas that we want to consider to say, hey, how can we be more engaged with the user, uh, no matter what part of their life they're in. So. Excellent. So from, from an industry standpoint, it, it's interesting for the audience to know that their acquisition strategies are industry agnostic. So if you have, you know, technologies across those industries you mentioned, whether it's finance, entertainment, leisure, you know, commerce as well. Or digital content. Or digital, digital content, content, then, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to talk to them. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, and uh, I'm Phil. Uh, great to be here, and thank you for inviting me on the panel. I'm very much looking forward to it, and to see all the, the great companies. Um, and in terms of what I do, uh, and what the company uh, is all about, um, Hasbro is a toy and gaming manufacturer, um, but we're better renowned for our brands and our characters and our stories and our worlds. Uh, Transformers and My Little Pony and Nerf and Play-Doh and um, we have some anchors in the portfolio which um, have served us well over time. Um, and it's really about them stories and characters and, and, and really building the best play experiences in the world for, for current consumers, future consumers, um, and the world's changed, the world's evolved, and that includes a lot of digital, it includes a lot of TV, social entertainment, um, and, and really a 360 degree strategy of uh, connecting to that consumer on a very deep level. Um, in terms of uh, innovation, uh, we've worked traditionally uh, with networks around the world um, of entrepreneurs and um, inventors, tinkerers, um, and not only the, pe the people who have, you know, a healthy bank account and, uh, and maybe a lab, but a tinkerer, you know, someone with a 3D printer in their basement who's just built a mechanism which can go into uh, or fuel a, a particular product or line. Um, and, and connecting and, and building real relationships with all them people has been very much critical to the uh, success of uh, bridging internal and external innovation together. Um, and then fuel in all the brands and uh, the sectors, the categories that we have. Um, so that's been rewarding and, and that's been something that senior management have uh, very much been on board of um, from a very, very, uh, uh, a long, long time ago, a long time ago. Um, in terms of how, you know, how we work with people, it's very different. We innovate new business models, um, you know, weekly, monthly. We have to change and adapt. Um, there's a traditional way of working with inventors, but we understand, you know, we have to be flexible. Uh, and we have to um, allow um, startups to breathe and allow them to uh, prosper. So um, with that, you know, we're very open to, uh, to work with them and partner with them. Excellent. One of, one of the companies we are talking to in Silicon Valley is a company called Made in Space. And they do additive manufacturing 3D printing in space. So I think with Hasbro, it will be very interesting to have a Transformers character that's actually really made in space. Yeah. You know, that would be <laughs> that would be hot. That would be hot. Thanks very much. My name is Anoop. Um, I'm the head of international business development and investments uh, at Protzibinzat Media. Uh, 
we are essentially the largest broadcast media group uh, in the German-speaking markets uh, with the reach of over 50 million people on our broadcast media every day uh, with over 30 million uh, active users every month uh, on our digital platforms uh, with an active investment arm. Um, I basically represent the investment arm and the areas where we look at is either consumer companies or companies um, in synergetic area which will help our core business like ad tech, virtual reality, video optimization, personalization technologies, um, um, as well as content related fields. Um, um, we are heavily invested in uh, digital platforms like e-commerce, lifestyle commerce, um, as well as pay VOD, ad VOD, like every other media groups. Um, but if you are a company which is looking to either um, grow in Europe or look at investments to grow in Europe, um, or, or even for um, looking for media companies as consumers of your product, uh, then it would be great to speak to you after the event. Excellent, thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Christina from Evernote. It's great to be here and I was super impressed with the quality of all the startups and the projects I've seen outside, so congratulations everybody. It's really great to see the ecosystem developing. And at Evernote, we are basically on a mission. We are on a mission to make the world smarter. We are building the modern workspace. Evernote is where you get things done. It's for knowledge workers, it's for people like you and, and me using our mind and trying to be as productive as we can. We believe that technology shouldn't be there to think for you. It should be a natural extension of your needs. It should anticipate what you need in context. And this is why at Evernote, it's all about augmented intelligence. Historically, we've been working with many startups and developers since seven years, since we were born, in order to accomplish our mission. And if you have great ideas, integrations with Evernote, just feel free to reach out to me. We are always, always looking uh, at, at improving the product and also finding other startups that can uh, plug in. Uh, we have great examples uh, of acquisitions in the past, uh, if you know Skitch or Penultimate. But then we have more than 30,000 developers worldwide working on our open API. The best projects uh, have been awarded the Evernote Platform Awards each year during our conference in San Francisco. And it's a great way for startups to get visibility, to develop and take their product and accelerate the go-to-market. So very happy to have a chat if you have uh, a good idea on how we can take Evernote to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, good to be here. My name is Krishna. I'm a partner at uh, DFJ Spree. Our business is startups, really. That's what we do. We fund startups or a venture capital fund. We invest in European companies primarily. And our goal is to help entrepreneurs realize their ambition, uh, grow their businesses, typically internationalize. We want to work with companies that have true international uh, ambition, I beg your pardon. And, and apart from providing capital, what we, what we like to do is, of course, uh, support you, challenge you, uh, you know, mentor you if that's required, and, and just as importantly, help you sell yourself to one of these three big companies here and make yourself lots of money uh, whilst doing that. So that's me. Excellent. So we, we, I, one round of questions, and, and this is a very direct question because I know some of the startups in the room would need to know. I'm a startup. I meet you today, I get your business card, I shake your hand. What's next? What, what will it take for me to work with each one of you? What will, what, will it be, what will you be looking for? Is there an advisory framework, something that you say, okay, hit this point, this point, this point, this point, and you'll be ripe for a conversation with us, right? So it, it, in the Valley, we, we talk about various elements of traction. People talk about growth hacks. People talk about user acquisition model within the confines of your industries and these conversations, what will it be? Will it be design? Will it be users? Will it be function? What will it be? And it, 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 it's not so much of a, a blueprint than it is an advice to startups to say, as you are going to meet me on the side right after now, 
start thinking of this, perfect your pitch towards this, what will it be? I, I'm happy to go first, for, for, probably because I have the most difficult, uh, you know, it's the most difficult answer for, for me anyway. I, there isn't a formula, let's be, let's be honest. You know, we invest in a wide variety of companies. We do roughly half the deals we invest in our digital companies. About a quarter are more enterprise centric and the other quarter companies developing, you know, what I like to call hard technology, you know, devices, semiconductors, etc. And so it really varies depending on the type of business you are. Uh, you know, if I was to maybe try to simplify it, uh, you know, things that we obviously want to see uh, a, a significant opportunity, someone trying to disrupt the market. That's probably one of the most important things we look for, someone trying to disrupt the market and by doing so, create a, a interesting business, a new business, obviously one with significant value and uh, that allows us to deploy our capital and help you grow that value. So disrupting a market, you know, suff sufficiently large opportunity obviously and it, it's difficult to say well I, I want to see X traction or Y traction because if you're a seed company you will have you know, a particular set of metrics, if you're a series C company you'll have a different set of metrics. So I, I, I won't go into metrics, I think uh, I will finish off by saying the thing that the other thing that I look, I look for, apart from you know someone trying to disrupt the market, is uh, some form of evidence to sh to demonstrate that actually your value proposition resonates with the market you're going after. I'll leave it at that. Excellent. First of all, it's important to just take the step and come and speak to us because you know sometimes we notice that people may think that oh. You know, I don't have everything ready now. I have this idea. I know I could do it, but actually it's not the right timing. And I think it just starts by, hey, just come, let's have a chat and let's share some ideas. At the end of the day, it's about the value proposition. It's about execution as well. And it needs to click. So we've had beautiful examples of very spontaneous conversations that led to amazing projects. But as I've mentioned before, we also had examples uh, and feedbacks from people who waited too long just to get the conversation started because they were too afraid. So just do it. Excellent. So ladies and gentlemen, for these two companies on the couch, your name, your company name, my value proposition is, boom, and that's it, just for these two. We'll get to the other three. <laughs> Media Group is pretty much two things that we look at. Uh, the first one is always adding new revenue streams. Um, so we see so much happening in video today that a lot of these companies help us uh, develop new sales revenue streams. So this way we grow, we also help the young companies grow and any company which is doing something exciting in, in, in video space or anything related to um, uh, mass media on the content side, we would be very happy to talk. Um, the second thing what we look at is, of course, you know, our core business is being disrupted every day. So we always look at companies in ad tech, uh, in personalization, virtual reality, and other areas which can help us uh, improvise and strengthen our core business. Um, so if you're in either of the two buckets, I think it would be a very good opportunity for us to connect. Excellent. So the thing that um, I like to look for when um, yeah, we're approached either with a, an infrastructure or a product or a service is really to put themselves into my shoes and look what organization that we're working with. You know, who is that target, target audience? What is that age group? Um, how do I make it more relevant to Hasbro? And so a lot of um, creative thought can be wrapped around your, your offering, make it relevant for something internal that me that either will be um, a brand that exists or a character that exists. And that's not to say that it should be enforced fitted into a brand or a character. What it does, it, it gives it relevance. And it gives it, um, people's eyes on it, will they, they instantaneously gravitate to it. And then we can subtract that and maybe apply it to other parts of the business. So it's about relevance. And um, you know, one of the things that you know, I, I, secondly, I champion is that this is a partnership between me and someone on the outside, and we're going to make this work, and we're going to give it its best 110% shot at presenting to not, either it be one team or either it be holistic across, you know, multiple categories and, uh, and brands across the organization. 
So it really is that give and take and also allowing to let go a little bit when it does come into, um, in, into our four walls. So it's a, probably 2.5 then. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll probably speak to it in two different perspectives. So I was part of uh, two startups that both got acquired. So I'm an entrepreneur, so I really understand uh, all the hardship and the um, things you have to work really hard to get to some kind of exit or grow your business really big. Um, and then of course from Rocket inside, I think I definitely agree a lot with what you said about from Hasbro is that you have to find the value uh, when you talk to any of the companies to say, hey, you, the reason why you talk to me is because of blah, 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 and you should align it to what the company is actually doing versus introduce, here's what, what my service does and you're trying to think about what can we do. Uh, you should really have a good idea of what you want to provide that's beneficial. Otherwise, there's so many people you talk to and it's hard to uh, concentrate. But from a, that, having said that, on the entrepreneur side, I, I think one of the advice I would like to give, you have to be able to explain it in like one minute. <laughs> so here we have three minutes, but you really have to, you know, be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish uh, and explain your story very, uh, very quickly. Otherwise, I think it's really hard to get the mind share of investors or uh, large, you know, strategic companies and stuff like that. So um, please focus on, you know, coming up with a very clear uh, description of what you want to do and how you benefit people. So. Excellent. Great advice all around. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time for us to see some startups, get some com competition going. Is that right? Yeah? Yes? Yes, please? Can we put some energy in the room for startups? Um, I'd like to invite Mike on stage to, no? You don't want to come on stage? <laughs> okay, it's all about me today. That's excellent. I can do this. So let's get the startups queued up. I know. I'm waiting for the screen. It goes first. Okay. Our first startup coming up is Photomap. Please put your hands together for Photomap. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Damir and I'm a, a co-founder and CEO of uh, Microblink, company behind Photomat. Uh, Photomat is world's first uh, camera calculator. Uh, our company Microblink uh, is mobile vision software company. So uh, we, are, we are a two years old company. Uh, we had a great team of young engineers uh, and uh, we developed uh, mobile advanced tech recognition technology. So uh, it is mobile OCR, so very fast, very efficient. And uh, our main business is actually selling uh, our licensing our technology through enterprise SDKs for uh, reading bills, uh, payment data from bills, IDs, barcodes, and things like that. So this is our background. And we created Photomat actually to uh, demonstrate, showcase our technology. And it, it turned out much bigger than we expected. So uh, what problem are we solving? So this is, this is Tom. He's 11. He, he struggles with, with math sometimes. So, uh, and he's all, uh, often wondering, how do I solve this math expression or this problem? Uh, at the same time, his parents can't help him because they also struggle with, struggle with math. So uh, we have a solution for, for, for them. And it's called Photomath. It is an application that can help solve math problems, expressions on their mobile phone. Here is how it works. So it is very simple. When you have a math problem to solve, you take your mobile, mobile device with Photomath, point your camera towards math expression, and it will instantly solve it for you. So 
So solution is written on the screen. But not only that, you can get step-by-step -step solution how to solve. So in human-like steps, how to solve. In US version, you have even have explanation what to do to solve it successfully. So this is familiar idea, I guess. This is where you've seen it. But we really built it. Uh, of course, an inspiration was, was because I was helping my son with his homework. And I, I thought there might be easier way to do it. So Photomath is a free app because we want, want it to be accessible to children all over the world. We have currently one and a half million monthly active users. Actually, it's, 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 it's more. This is from last week. And 400,000 expressions, math expressions, are scanned per day only on iOS. Actually, again, last week, yesterday, it was more than a million. And why? Because we released Android four days ago, and it is now number one application in educational cat cat category on uh, Google Play. We expect, because of Android, much, much bigger growth. Uh, potential market, there is more than a billion, uh, even close to two billion school children worldwide. And uh, we want to get them as, as users. Uh, we can really address their pain point and help them throughout years of education. So this is Photomat, the world's first camera calculator, and we believe the future of education. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Photomath. I think your one line pitch is uh, use my technology because the Big Bang Theory believes in it. <laughs> right? So, to my judges in the media sector, you've seen how he segued from reading to media and back. Your feedback? First of all, I wish I could travel back in time at have Photomath with me <laughs> as a student. That would have been really, really helpful. Now, this is huge for students. Are you planning to do anything on the teacher's side? Because you are looking at disrupting education, and there's much to do also when you look at teaching from a teacher's perspective. Uh, we, are, we are helping students, and, uh, but we are getting feedback from teachers. So this is great that, of course, there is a little controversy as it is with every disruptive technology or, or product. Uh, but we are getting feedback like this is great, you should maybe do it in a bit different way to help children. Uh, but, but we are getting very positive and very uh, feedback. And we, we have been contacted by biggest educational companies in the world. Uh, and th they are looking to partner with us to use our technology because we, we discovered formula how actually what is needed and what, what is wanted in educational, as educational app in the market. So I was very curious, like, uh, I think maybe less than a few weeks ago, like, I mean, it was all of a sudden became like very, very big names. So I was curious, like, how, did you know it was gonna be big or how did it happen? Like, I'm just curious, you know, share the story. I think it's very good for other no. people to know. Actually, we built an uh, application as demonstration of our technology, we thought this might be a nice use case and uh, it will be free marketing for us. It actually turned out that it's uh, much bigger, so it was totally unexpected. And now we are trying to actually use this opportunity and uh, build real product and real business on it. Yeah, I think what you've built is uh, is fantastic, and I, I, I'm with you because I could have done it many years ago. But um, one question: the 1.5 million users that you, you, the, or downloads that you've got now, where's the majority of the downloads coming from? Uh, it was coming from uh, the U.S. and Canada, but uh, it was not localized. Uh, only now it is localized on Android. Uh, it's now 10 languages, but but uh, we will we will localize it to other languages also. The reason I ask is that, you know, in China, education is just right on the hot plate, and um, to try and advance your child 
um, with foreign language, with um, fundamental learning and arithmetic and, um, and everything else from a relatively early age is there for the taking. And that's something that you should really consider as you move forward because it may be that one of them um, not so emerging territories with a lot of people will be the hot ticket. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, oh, one more question. One more question. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. So, uh, my question is maybe uh, a slightly higher level. So, I, I'm intrigued that you develop the application to prove out your technology. My question to you is actually, what do you want to be as a business? Do you want to be an education, online education, or an education technology business, or actually is your aspiration to yeah. be something different? Because the the uh, genesis of the company obviously wasn't the application. It, it wasn't, but we obvious, obviously know how to build it. And, and uh, this is a question we are asking ourselves every day. Uh, we have two successful uh, businesses there. One is B2B and one is B2C. But we, we, we don't think it's, it's still a, pro a problem, a real problem, and we can deal with it, really. I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Just, just curious. Amazing product, but curious to know what's the complexity levels that you cover, like you know, from basic to what level. To like sure. first, first version was from 10 to 14 year old children, and now we we are uh, we entered high school, like quadratic equations, systems of linear equations, inequalities. Uh, now we will uh, we are doing some uh, uh, polynomial algebra, very interesting. Really, some some really p addressing some pain points. Like, it's very interesting. But it's, it's advancing. It's still not where we would like it to be, but it's getting better and better. For example, we, we had 1.1 uh, million scans yesterday, and we solved 700,000. So it's not bad. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So the in the interest of time, we will have three minutes for each startup and two minutes of Q&A. We may not be able to get through each one of the judges, but just so we can have an, uh, enough feedback. So our next startups, can we have Rormix to the stage? Please put your hands together for Rormix. Hi there, uh, my name's Man. I'm the uh, founder of Rawmix. Rawmix is a central platform for the uh, social discovery of curated music videos from independent artists. Um, you can say we the, we're the independent version of Evo. And uh, the reason why we created this is because um, a lot of the platforms out there are way too broad to support the discovery of independent content. And um, now, content and video platforms are moving in that direction. So one example is um, Twitch TV, which is a platform purely based around gaming. Funny or Die.com, a uh, platform purely based around uh, comedy. And what we're doing is uh, a platform purely based around independent music videos. So in terms of what we're doing is all the content is going to our platform and then it's then reorganized in a way to make discovery a lot easier. So and it's also curated as well. So the artists are tagged as commercial artists. So say, for example, you're looking for Jay-Z or Kanye West. We then help you find an independent version of that. Um, we also have a feature which is called Quick Discovery, uh, where we take the best 15 seconds of each music video. It's like yes, no, yes, no. So kind of like um, Tinder, but for music. And um, on top of that, not only do you get to discover amazing music, but we also reward the user for their level of contribution to the community. So the more you interact with the community, the more points you build up and then get rewarded uh, through the marketplace. And um, from an artist's perspective, it's not just you guys, uh, you know, as an independent artist, upload your video and that's it. We tend to create as many points of exposure as possible. So we have some of the major record labels using our platform uh, for scouting talent. And um, we have some big festivals approaching us to scout talent. Uh, we have a partnership with all the major venues um, across the UK, which I'll explain a little bit later on. And um, in terms of like our early traction so far, so 
you know, we've only built a basic, like, minimum viable product of our app right now. And so far, we've had around about 6,000 music videos uploaded to our platform. And we've had around about 200,000 uh, downloads of our app. Uh, we were featured in one of the largest app stores in China, uh, which gives us an advantage because, you know, YouTube is blocked in China, and so is Vivo. And um, we're used in 180 countries with uh, Mexico being number one, and then uh, China and Colombia. And also, um, we have a partnership with 700 gyms across the UK, where basically the MTV of their screens with our own music video channel which has been very successful, and that's expanding to 2,500 gyms across the US and Canada. And um, in total, so far, that generates around about 1.2 million views. And uh, in terms of monetization, rather than annoying the user by placing 30-second adverts in front of all the videos, we want to blur the line between advertising and content. And where next step is to build a piece of technology which is in-video native advertising where we scan the music video and then look for opportunities of placement by putting billboards within the music video and making it look as natural as possible. And um, so finally, in terms of, also, we also um, share the revenue with the artists so they earn money through this as well. And uh, you know, we're a small team, we're four co-founders, uh, seven full-time. Uh, we raised a, a proof of concept round. We're based in Manchester. And we're basically here to you know, raise our next round of funding. And um, I encourage you guys to check out the app, give us some feedback, and uh, thank you for your time. To the judges. Um, so we have an uh, adjacent unit which is into music, and one of the problems that they face is, is to identify artists when they are not really big. Um, how, how difficult is it for you to, or how do you go about the process of uh, getting the independent artists on board who are still not well-known names? Um, how do you go about the whole process? So, so just to summarize, how difficult is it for artists to come onto our platform? So um, at first it was very difficult, but right now a lot of artists are coming onto our platform. and. Um, you know, we've generated a lot of press. We've been in like Billboard magazine, Forbes, Mashable, all that stuff. So they're all hearing about us and they tell other artists and then their fan base. So they're all coming to our platform and we've got to a point where we actually don't, haven't got that far to build the technology to support the back end system. So we have a huge backlog. So that could easily, right now, we have 6,000 music videos, but it technically should be 10,000. Uh, but more, you know, it's going viral, so more and more people are uploading videos. Um, yeah, so I have a question about your sort of product strategy. Um, so having a marketplace for independent um, musicians seems pretty good, very clear, right? And then you also mentioned that you're doing sort of in-video advertisement, uh, which is also very cool by itself. So how do you prioritize? You know, you're a startup, and th these are very different. Building a technology to monetize uh, videos yeah. is very different than building a marketplace for um, you know, advertisers or musicians. So I was very curious, what, what is your current thought on that? So right now, we purely f focus on growth. Um, so monetization is a lot further down the line for us. Uh, you know, we want to have as many endpoints as possible. So as we were saying, we're expanding into all the gyms across the US and Canada. Um, we want to go international on that, create as many endpoints, and then from there, hopefully, we can then build our monetization platform. Aman, did you say the artists are, uh, when they when they come to your platform, they're recording their original content or someone else's content? So, you know, so I think you referred to a, an independent version of an established uh, artist song. Is that is that right? Did I get that right? Or yeah, is it original yeah. content? So it's all in, uh, original content. It's just, um, you know, say you, say you go on YouTube and it's very, there's a, a lot of amazing original independent content in there, but it's very hard for you to find that. So we make an association. Um, so this person sounds like this and then kind of works from there. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next startup to the stage, Silver Push.
So just put your hands together for Silver Push. Hi, uh, I'm Hitesh, co-founder and CEO of Silver Push. Silver Push is a cross-device user mapping and targeting platform. So what that means is we track and identify events of users from their multiple devices like laptop, mobile, TV, and map it under a single user identity. And that identity is our own unique identifier. Now, before I tell you what uh, exactly we do in detail, uh, I'll tell you what the traction has been so far. We, we launched our product a uh, year back. Uh, now we are already at a $5 million run rate and already profitable with revenues from different parts of the world. And so talking about uh, what's the problem that we're trying to solve. Currently, users, as users, we are exposed to so many different devices. We use laptops, we use tablets, we use phones, and now a new class of devices, which is wearables. So for marketers or for so any, any, anyone to understand a user's behavior as a collective user, it's impossible. And that's the problem we're trying to solve by creating a single identity for them. Yeah, so how it works is we have our SDK on the phones, which is actually uh, SDK which can receive or actually capture ultrasonic or inaudible, human inaudible audio. And this SDK stays on the phone, and whenever it's in the uh, range of devices uh, which are integrated with our audio beacon, like TV ads or a desktop cookie, uh, the phone receives that audio and sends it to our server where we create a single uh, identity for the user on our platform. But the thing is, how do we use it? How, how, how does this uh, mapping actually work for us? So, and how, how do we make money? So we make money for, from analytics. We provide analytics to the TV advertisers and desktop uh, advertisers or uh, marketers where they actually don't have any idea who the users are, for example, TV buying happens is like totally blind. So we give them complete analytics, understanding of their users, where they are based, or the video completion rates for uh, the TV uh, buying, and then advertising. So now they know who their users are, they can actually reach out to them again, or target their same users again on the phone as well, basically reinforce the brand. And this, is a huge opportunity because TV advertising in itself is 400 billion industry, which is st st growing, and then mobile is growing quickly. And we, as a company, are perfectly placed because we are trying to move the TV dollars, TV uh, spends to mobile, and can provide the analytics to the brands. These are the, some of the entry barriers we're trying to create. We, we can detect TV. Uh, we have multiple patents around our technology. We've already mapped billions of devices. And some of the customers we're already working with, all the big brands. And we have an experienced team with complementary skills, uh, sales and technology uh, in the team, in the founders itself. And we're backed by good funds. Uh, we raised our seed round from IDG 500 and some other funds and some key angel investors who have been helping us. Yeah, and so this is what we do, basically. Yeah, map the users across the multiple devices. Thank you very much. Judges, two minutes, three questions. Well, I have a very quick question. I, I just want to understand how the tech works in a real scenario. So I have the app on my phone. The phone is dormant. What happens? I'm sitting in my living room. How does it get activated? Right, so the SDK is in the app. We don't have our app we distribute the SDK through other apps. So it could be in any app and it runs in the background and you don't have to open the app at that particular time to, for us to actually create that match. Could you elaborate on your initial growth tactics and also say a few words about how do you plan to sustain them going forward? Uh, I, I missed the earlier part of the question. If you could elaborate on your growth tactics, because we've seen you, you've reached sure. quite a, a good amount of users rapidly. 
Sure. And I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on the tactics you've had. In sure. Uh, so in, in our case, it hasn't been the issue of getting the demand, getting the clients actually. The brands themselves want to work with us. Uh, it's that we, we, we didn't have the bandwidth to work with uh, all the brands, but uh, so now we are trying to scale the team, trying to scale the technology to support the demand because in fact, TV ha is so b such a big industry and for brands who are spending so much money on TV, they have no idea uh, where they are spending. They are depending on TRPs or other uh, different ways to understand how the spends are happening, but actually it's all blind. So we provide them transparency of who the actual users are or where the kind of users they are actually reaching out. Is there uh, any issues that you're facing in Europe with respect to privacy? We haven't yet started in Europe. We have been uh, in US and Southeast Asia mostly. But yeah, as in we know there could be some issues and we are working with IAB and MMA to make sure that we don't do that because we don't work in the audible uh, range or actually we don't do anything in the audible range or do anything with the actual audio. It's only our particular frequency that we work at. So it, we are hoping that it should be okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our next startup, Tamoko. Hey, my name is Max and I'm CEO and co-founder of Tomoko. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about connecting digital and physical media, which most of you will know as proximity marketing. And we all know that proximity marketing and proximity technologies are going to be one of the most important channels for advertisers and brands to engage with their consumers in the next few years, no matter if it's through NFC or QR or beacons. But what we've learned over the last two and a half years is that if you use either one of these channels in isolation, you as an advertiser don't learn enough about the consumer and you don't get enough data about the consumer to actually provide them with the most relevant or customized content. So we as Tomoko have solved that issue and we've built a platform that includes all different pro proximity technologies in one, in one dashboard. And that includes NFC, QR, Bluetooth beacons, Wi-Fi and geofencing. So what does it do? Our platform analyzes in real time if you have customer engagement through any of those technologies and then use the, uh, the content management function to determine in real time what content is most personalized to you or most relevant to you. And that uh, could either be through NFC or any, other the, any of the other technologies. So imagine you scan a beer QR code in a magazine and then walk to the next supermarket. Our platform makes sure that the offer that you get for a beacon is about the beer and not the hand cream or something. And of course we have APIs and SDKs, so you as a brand don't even need to use our beautiful dashboard, but you can do it from your own CRM system. A few of uh, our recent campaigns that we've done is with BMW in a magazine. They've used QR and NFC to drive app downloads, and now we're deploying beacons in all of their stores, so a customer can walk into the store and receive information about the right car instantly. We've done a campaign with AT&T in New York where they use NFC to drive people to the stores, um, handing out free, free um, tickets for a film festival. And we had engagements in, in 10 days at over four, four seconds. Uh, sorry, one interaction every four seconds. And recently we've also deployed beacons in Dublin for the Web Summit. And in just one week had 23,000 engagements. So we at Tomoko basically want to make sure that brands are able to utilize proximity technologies in the right way and that US customers don't get spammed. Thank you very much. Judges, we have two minutes, three questions from the judges. We had a chat earlier, so I, I, I've asked my questions. So I'm not gonna ask my questions. Again? Yeah, uh, so I was curious, are there any that's more interested about your technology platform than others? Sorry, any verticals? What? Are there any verticals? So, you know, whether it's a, uh, like, uh, like, you know, sort of these event-based type stuff, or, um, we or like, are there 
we focus on, on retail mainly um, because what we were trying to do is we're trying to deploy proximity assets and that could be as NFC tags on price tags in supermarkets or beacons in bars, pubs, at events. So what it means is with the first brands, we deploy those assets and in the future we leave them there. So if Coca-Cola wants to do a beacon campaign in the future, they don't need to de deploy any more beacons. They can, but they don't need to. They can also use the hundreds of thousands of beacons that we already have in place in different venues if we want to. So we focus on retail right now for deployment and then try to build up a marketplace for brands and retailers. Yeah. So I have a question about the deployment of uh, beacons to stores, because obviously driving kids and parents to the toy store is um, an ideal. A lot of us buy online, given. And um, do you work directly then with the retailers or do you work with the manufacturers? What, what's your uh, approach? Um, on one hand, we work directly with the brands and retailers. And on the other one, we are focusing on two different types of partnerships. One with app developers to say our SDKs go into every app that, that you're building for any of those brands, no matter if they want to use it now or not. But in the future, they have the opportunity to do so anyway. And secondly, through, um, through our suppliers because our suppliers are guys like Estimode in the beacon space or um, NXP in the NFC space, and they are deploying a lot of those anyway for the brands, and we, we basically are the preferred partner for the software that sits on top of it. What's the uh, key ROI measure that your customers are looking at when they think about deploying you? Can you share that with us? I think it's difficult to say because every, every single campaign they're doing depends on what technology they're using, um, and what content they want to deliver. So if it's app downloads, then they want to use NFC to, and, and see that they have more app downloads than if, if they don't use it. Um, if they're using geofences, they want to see that more people come to the stores. Um, but it really depends on if it's a brand, if it's a retailer, and which technology they use. Coming in quick succession, Celio. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Jakub uh, from Telio, and Telio is the easiest way to share TV moment. So as you probably all noticed, TV is changing. And now when we watch a program, we watch the interaction and engagement. And that's why we, we go to Facebook and Twitter to, to discuss about what, we, what we've just seen on the TV screen. However, you know, if you've just seen something and want to tweet about it, then you basically would say like, oh my God, that was hilarious, for example. And that's, that's basically text. So anyone that haven't seen the show would basically find it a noise. So what we figure that would be great is actually being able to capture a video of what you have just seen on the TV screen and include it in the message. So for example, if you've seen a goal in football or maybe a box kick in rugby, you know, you'd like to get it and tweet it straight away. And that's what we've done. We created a complex technology, but actually we make it easy for users. So just one button press to get the moment from TV to your device. So, so how it works. So imagine that you are watching a movie at home, and let's say that, for example, you are using a second screen application from Prozeven, Santwines, and then within this application, you'd, you'd have a grab a moment button integrated. Then just simple click on the button and we deliver to your tablet a two minute replay of what just happened on the TV screen. So you can comment, comment it, edit it, and, and share it to social media. Uh, so we had the initial traction, so we work with uh, 20 TV shows in four countries with the main international format like uh, MasterChef and Big Brother. And uh, I wanted to show you a highlight of how Telio works, but before that, let me just summarize the main benefits that we provide to the broadcasters. So first of all, with Telio technology, sorry for this. So first of all, with Telio technology of clipping the TV and online video signal, we provide new ways of engagement and interaction with the show. Secondly, we help broadcasters to drive users from social media to, towards the uh, online content. And thirdly, we create new revenue stream for the clips that we share in social media and we share it with the broadcaster. So hope you got interested and that's a short clip about how Telio works. Wow, that was really awesome. It would be cool to share it with my friends. 
But hey, now you can, and it's super easy. In Telio, you can grab the best moments and share them as video clips. Press the red button to get a video clip of what you just saw on the show. Mark the start and the end point of the moment you like. Select your favorite social media to share the clip. Lean back and enjoy the great feeling of people liking and retweeting your clip. Tell you, the easiest way to share the moments. Thank you. Let's tell you the easiest way to share TV moments. We have a lot of media judges, <laughs> so if we can have the judges, all of our media judges, two minutes, three questions. Um, very curious to understand how you you know, are tackling probably the big problem with second string we are facing is about user com users coming back, users engagement, user stickiness. Are, uh, I don't know at what stage you are right now, if you're already working with a few brands, um, mm. are the users using it after the first, second or third use? Yeah, so we are actually now building a community around those video clips. So because we create different competition during the show, so people, pe users f can, for example, grab, grab share moments and win the product that they see in the video clip. So, you know, so this cre creates the motivation and triggers the users to use it. And when they, when they win awards, they just come back and, you know, and in that way we try to engage them with, the, uh, with Telio and, uh, and make sure that, you know, that we get more and more users. I saw that you work with certain shows, uh, but do you need the, the, the approvals of these shows or do you work with the brands or the media companies? How, how, yep. how does it work? So basically we work together with the broadcasters. So we don't offer this solution directly to the customers and kind of offering it illegally. We actually talk with the broadcaster. We agree with which shows we could offer it directly to the end customers. And we integrate tell you today touch points that they have with the customers. So we integrated tell you to the official MasterChef application as a part, as a functionality within it. So we didn't create our own second screen application, but we become a part of existing touch points that the broadcaster have with the with the viewers. Another question. Um, I mean, it, it seems that it would work really well for um, cartoons and animations and. Um, a lot of um, aligned content with franchises that you know, with a, which are deep in, in characters and worlds and everything like that. Let's say My Little Pony, for instance. So it would make sense that the user could clip their favorite part of the show, and you know, kids they'll put the DVD um, or the Netflix on or play something from YouTube time and time and time and time again. So it feels like that you could really kind of build a fan base from a, from a kid's perspective. So have you ever thought of anything you know, in that vein? Mm, yeah, we, we were thinking uh, in, in, a, in a what way we can actually engage in and what we should do to build a community around those video clips. So we, we're thinking now more in doing different remixes with the clips so you could actually you know, grab the moments that you like, you could maybe do a meme picture out of it, share it further. So, it was, so in that sense we tried to kind of attach those people to the, to the community. So we, we, we are starting with this, so it's, it's still in the early stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next startup is interested in telling you stories in virtual reality. Please welcome TimePath. In 2015, Facebook, Microsoft, Samsung, and Sony, among others, will release affordable hardware for virtual reality. This will create a demand that already just in two years will create, will be over $2 billion. This has made several companies starting to create virtual reality content. There's either people coming from the movie industry and they create 360 videos where you can look in any direction but that are not interactive or people from coming from video games where you can shoot in any direction but there's no interaction and characters have no real depth. 
we think that a true virtual reality experience should have both. It should be interactive, and at the same time, it should have a story. Four years from now, your living room will look like this. And we think that you should feel like this. You should feel in a virtual environment where autonomous virtual, where autonomous virtual characters unfold the story and where you can become a character in that story where you can assume any role that you want. So how do I become a character in virtual reality? Through social interaction, you play by pretending. Say you're in a gangster's movie. So if you want to become a character in a gangster's movie, you need to act like a gangster. You need to move and talk like a gangster. So if you say at the right moment, make it look like an accident, then it will actually look like an accident. And all the characters will report to you and you will be able to change some aspects of the story. But if you do decide to do nothing and just sit on your couch, then some other character will assume that role in order the story can still unfold. In this way, you can have best of both worlds. You can have experiences that are narrative and still interactive. How does it work? So it, it, it's, it's like a, the movie, the game, or maybe you've seen the, the Truman Show. It's basically, you need to take the, the player as the center and you need to be, build a huge complot around him in order that, for example, if you need to have a car accident at the right moment, you need to make sure that the car is there in the right place and, the, and at the right time. To build this huge complot, the artificial intelligence that is used for video games is not useful. Therefore, we created our own and we patented some parts of it. And with this, we are now finishing our first example of content, which is named Ted is Dead. Um, so to wrap up, at TimePath, we create stories in virtual reality, we produce them and we want to distribute them steadily, on demand, and thanks for your attention. Judges? Uh, yep, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts about um, how long do you think a story, you know, I, I think the vision's really good, but the technology have always been sort of lacking behind uh, for any sort of VR-related sort of business or games. So I was curious to hear some of your thoughts about um, how long do you think a game can last? You know, wearing the headset, playing the VR world seems uh, nice, but I'm not sure how long people can, <laughs> can do it for. You're asking about how much a virtual reality experience can last? Uh, or or the like the physicalness of being in a virtual reality to, to be part of the story, you know? Is it like a five minute story or an hour story? So in, if you want to use like the hardware that is now currently available for general public, I would say, I would target 20, 25 minutes, not more, but basically because the ocular stress it provokes. But this is getting, I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I did my PhD on this, and when I was doing my PhD, there were these huge head-mounted displays, and you could not be more than 10 minutes, basically because you had a headache, it was too heavy. Now it's, it's, it's really good, in, in the sense that it's quite, you can be 25 minutes in a virtual reality, and you don't, this, in terms of user experience, it's comfortable. Here we have shown uh, a small experience in virtual reality of seven, eight minutes, and not one person has felt sick or uncomfortable. I think, I think as, uh, as well as the technology, it's the, the story and the content is king, right? You know, it's immersing, it's immersing yourself in um, the right environment and being emotionally connected to them, you know, who, whoever you're playing with for that 25 minutes and you'll continue that chapter the next evening and the next evening. And I think, you know, I, I think the promise is great. I agree uh, with James here. I just think that now it's, um, you know, the technicalities plus the um, whoever's going to be on board as a partner, which will be the proof in the pudding. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, with the advance of Google Cardboard and, you know, everything else with it, um, competitors, um, Samsung, everyone else coming with their low cost um, you know, systems, I think you know, you're on the right path. So I think you did a great job. Thanks. Just adding to that, I think you know, the, the fear is that once this virtual reality feels so good, 
it's going to be hard to get back to real life and do your real job, you know. So I think going back to your points before, it's just the question of how are you going to help your users set the limit on one side? Are you working with researchers? Like, what does it do to the human mind? Okay, so actually my background is on research, so I can answer this pretty well. So we know virtual reality is good for many things. It can help you learn stuff, for example, if you for training or, for, or if you have phobias, it can, it can really help. For example, if you are afraid of spiders, the best way to recover from that is to expose you to virtual spiders. Actually, that's how it's done. And then, you, because, okay, also for social training, I would love to be able to, to do a prototype, for example, for, uh, to learn languages. So you have the class with the teacher, and then instead of doing this boring homework where you have to write stuff, you actually have to talk with virtual characters you know, at your home, or even you can share the virtual reality experience with other students and um, and I'll follow the story with them. Which brings also the question, are you working on a also B2B expansion of okay, this so that's <coughs> um, Now, people don't have virtual reality at home, okay? This will be the case in two years, but not now. So now what we're proposing is basically we work, we, we work as a production service. So if you are interested in having a virtual reality, either for a promotional event or to train your, your, your employees or whatever purpose you want a virtual reality, then I come, we, we, we check what scenario you have in mind, we propose something concrete, and now it's basically a production service. Once this is working, and we will also use it to refine our production process, etc. Then we want just to put it online in order anyone who wants to create a, virtual, a story in virtual reality can do it. I mean, this is based on role playing. You can do role playing with your friends inside a virtual world and then create a story with them. We just put the tools and you will j just be able to do it like this. Is that you've, you've sort of answered part of my question. So if I follow you correctly, John, you want to be, ultimately you want to be a technology provider rather than a content creator, is that right? Is so that how you see the future of the company? So what I s think is now we need to prove that our approach can make true virtual reality experiences. And I think the best way to prove this is just to make the content. Once we've proven this, what I think is that people that have tried this will want to create their own. So then let's help them. Excellent. So Thank I, you. I think what you're doing is interesting. There's an interesting question around market timing. Let's yeah, talk about it that's, that's, so actually I, I, I mean, that was a crazy idea. I did the PhD on this. Then I saw the opportunity because the hardware is coming. So thanks. Thank you very much. In quick succession, please join me in welcoming Toy Mill. Toy Mill. This is Viola, she's three and a half. These are her friends and family. They call her Meatball. These are the mailmen. They deliver toy mail. Messages sent from our app to our toys. This is Meatball's mom, checking to see if Meatball misses her. I miss you. <laughs> you miss me? And here's Meatball, sending a toy mail back from her toy. No, there are no time to miss you. This is Meatball's dad asking her what she wants for dinner. Here's Viola's grandma. He tells her every night how much she wants to squeeze a meatball. Because she can give you a big hug. I'm going to give you all my imagination. Toy mail. Stay connected with the kids you love. Um, so that first sound bite you heard was a toy mail that I received on my way to Barcelona. I was in LA. I took many, many flights and to get here. And I was reminded of why I make toy mail when I received that voicemail. Um, these are not my slides. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically messaging is huge, right? And 
it doesn't exist for children. And that's what we're trying to solve. We're trying to, to create a system that enables children to send messages with their loved ones. Um, and great, these slides. Um, so you saw the video. Um, so uh, there's about 2.5% of kids under the ages of 10 years old have phones. So that's a huge untapped market of children who have no means of communicating remotely with loved ones. Um, so basically what we've created is, is WhatsApp for kids. So you record a voice message using our app from your phone, from anywhere in the world, and you send it along. The toys have Wi-Fi in them, so they will check for new messages every so often and alert the child when they have a new message. Um, and then when they receive the, the alert, they can use the play button to play back that message and the reply button to send a message right back to your phone where memories are stored forever. So that's going too fast, but... <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll do it without the slides. <laughs> so the next step, what we're working on right now is, is group chat and toy-to-toy -to -toy sharing. So not only can kids send and receive messages with their family, they can always um, also send them with their friends as long as they're approved as a sender through the toy mail app, which is approved by the parent. Um, and um, so we've been out for a year now, and we've had a lot of great traction. We've actually just sold out of 15,000 units. Um, for each toy that we sell, we see about four downloads of our app. Um, and that's really encouraging because we haven't enabled toy-to-toy -to -toy, um, messaging yet, as well as sharing through our networks. Um, and so th the way this is unfolding, though, is you know we've been selling our toys now through retail and, and online, but now we're seeing a lot of the major players in the toy industry come to us and want to take our technology and put it into their products. So we're actually in negotiations with a few of the major toy players to actually put our technology in characters that are already known and well-loved by children. Um, and then in addition to that, the way we scale is by um, selling premium app services. So our, our app is a free download, but um, once we enable um, some of these other features, there will be premium app services. Um, and then in addition to that, this is, this is all Wi-Fi, so we can go beyond messaging. We can send out stories and songs and educational content to the toys every day. Um, yeah, so that's, that's about it. <laughs> Excellent. How are you? How are you doing? I'm sorry. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, I, I mean, I, yes, I've seen this several times, and, and I think what you've achieved is fantastic. And um, not only have you spotted a gap, but um, you've managed to create that emotional connection to the device and the trust between parent and child and, um, and parent and the system because obviously, you know, putting things into the hands of the kids and having them um, communicate with it is, um, you know, it, it, it's a personal thing. You know, it, it's like, like you said, it's about the willingness to, to, to bridge that connection, what a phone would do. Um, but my great question is, um, you know, what, what are you looking for next? What's your, what's your, um, your big ask? So, the way we scale is by putting this into millions of toys, and so, you know, we've developed this technology for a couple of years now. We've worked out all of the kinks connecting it to our, you know, home Wi-Fi networks and connecting it to hundreds of d devices, Android and iOS, um, as well as just the child security issues that, that we've had to sort of program out and, and work through. So now we're, we're really at a place where we can scale, and, and that's why we're speaking with um, other toy companies to put this into their products. Um, but you know, what gets us going is that, of course, this is about, we started out as connecting with children because there, there was that huge untapped market. Um, but we love the idea of creating technology for kids that doesn't put them in front of another screen. And this is a problem that parents are facing all the time now, not knowing you know, how to deal with this because kids are spending, uh, on average times, eight hours a day in front of a screen. So what we're doing is, is all about creating technology for kids that doesn't put them in front of a screen. What, what do you think is the 
actual addressable age uh, range for your proposition? So we're finding that, um, well, so we went out to market with about three to eight. We're finding kids as old as 11 are using it and kids as young as two are using it. We actually also have some adults using it, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, that's really where our, our sweet spot is right now. Excellent, thank you very much. So, three days. 23 startups. Now we have, last but not least, the 24th startup to close out the round, Ustad Mobile. Please put your hands together for the champion and the last startup, Ustad Mobile. <laughs> Good job. Well, we got a bit of a preview, so I'll try to get to the new stuff as quickly as we can. Is this the first slide? Can we go back? I guess we can. Yes. So now, rightly, billions of dollars being put into education in, bingo. Now, rightly, billions of dollars being put into education in less developed countries where it's amongst the most difficult situation in the world. But what's really happening? When we send books and materials to a village in Afghanistan, what's happening? Are they being read and educating minds? Are they being burned? Are they propping up wobbly tables? We don't really know. So what we do know is that these learners don't have smartphones. In fact, there are three billion people who have something like this that you might remember from before. So we got thinking, what can we do with this technology? Because people say that smartphones are going to take over the world. Well, the most popular phone in Afghanistan hasn't been sold by Nokia for two years. So they're going to be waiting a little while before that happens. So what we did is said, let's make a mobile learning platform that works on any device, online or offline, feature phone or smartphone or PC. We wanted to allow people to make their own content in their own language. Our apps and our content offering platforms are used in Persian, Pashto, Arabic, and seven Zambian languages, which is unique to our software. And then once we use this software, the accountability gap is closed. So the donors that are spending billions of dollars, rightly to improve education where it's really needed, can know how many minutes were they learning for, what are their quiz scores looking like, or is nobody actually touching it at all because our education content is damn boring and it sucks. Maybe we need to improve it. So it's disrupting things because things that used to be just nice pictures with smiling kids are now quantifiable, can now be held accountable. We have active paying customers in Iraq, Afghanistan, Zambia, Kenya, and a few other countries with smaller things going on, including United Nations agencies, US and uh, UK government agencies too. Uh, concluding that we have illiterate police women are using our app to learn basic literacy, uh, children's literacy uh, throughout schools around Zambia, created by a partner library, uh, teaching um, Kenyan slum, uh, people, youth in Kenyan slums, basic IT skills and uh, web design, and uh, nomadic parents in Afghanistan using this to learn literacy. So a really wide range of uh, use cases because of the DIY nature of the content creation process. So that's all very nice, let's save the world, but uh, can we pay the bills? Well, yes we can because uh, the strongest growth is in emerging markets. Learning management systems are a $1.3 billion market. Mobile learning is, depending on how you measure it, up into multiple billions of dollars. So it's not just for charity. There's a real market that needs to be addressed. So what we do is create a platform that works with the conditions that are there right now and will prevail for many years. And we give people a platform that works in their situation for dramatically lower cost of ownership than what's a ra around right now on the market. And mobile learning is going up from $2.5 billion to $9.5 billion. That's a, a Deloitte company that came up with those numbers, not us. 
And of course, the strongest growth, like a lot of things, is emerging markets. Well, it's emerging markets where we really have the upper hand. So this is us, I'm Mike. I, uh, I made a small typing mistake in 2005 and found myself on a plane going to Afghanistan. Don't do that, it's pretty, it's pretty painful. And I st wound up sp staying there seven years building an education technology company there. Uh, my partner, Varuna, is uh, over in Dubai, and uh, Shami is our mentor who worked at Yahoo. So we'll welcome any questions that these folks have, or if you have any questions of your own, I'm around. Judge it. Phil, our CEO's preferred advice to entrepreneurs is don't do it. Don't do it unless you're really, really passionate. You have the passion, clearly, but I was wondering, as you're building a company, what would be the three main learnings you would like to share with other entrepreneurs that are in the same stage as you? Um, three main learnings. I'm pretty tired of startups telling me that um, it doesn't matter if anybody's willing to pay because we've actually bootstrapped the company for the most part. We have $70,000, $80,000. Now, most of that revenue actually came from projects. But the fact that the customer's gonna say, well, your app doesn't quite work yet. Uh, but you know what? I'll pay you thousands of dollars. I'll put you on a plane. I'll put you up in a decent hotel. Please help us solve this damn problem. Is a good indicator that there's money um, available for a solution. So I think if nobody is paying you, ask questions, why is nobody willing to pay? And fix that immediately. So that you ca don't need to wait and die when the venture capital doesn't come through. Um, Good motto. <laughs> that would be <laughs> one learning point. The second learning point I would say is emerging markets do matter and don't treat them as a charity case. You can build products. You can build products that they that people need, that people can pay for, and uh, they have the right to be considered the same as everyone else. Um, I think those are the two main ones, and that encapsulates quite a lot. And yeah, like you say, if you don't really care about it, if you're just thinking, well, you know, I sort of fun, I want to be a startup and I want to sell it for a couple million later, uh, you know, just go and work for a consultancy company and talk trash, they'll pay you and you won't have a chance of losing. We saved, we Mike, saved the best for last. Saying, can I ask you, you said you have some customers, can you tell us, give us a flavor of uh, who your ideal type of customer is? Ooh, I'm gonna have to be diplomatic. Um, well, our idea, uh, let me tell you who our existing customer is and let me tell you who I want our customer to be. So our current customer is actually government agencies. So uh, United Nations agencies or UK government or US government and we want to transition better will be actually the governments in those countries when we're delivering things that are at a price point and at a stability level that the government in that country wants to buy it because education is at these levels is a public good that's normally taxpayer funded for the majority of the market. Uh, better still will be when we create this in chunks that the learner and the parent can actually uh, purchase a la carte themselves. So that's who our customer is and who we want the customer to be in the future. Thank you, that's great. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Easy crowd favorite. So, we're waiting for a screen that comes up. Audience voting, certainly we want to hear your voice as well as the voices of our judges. Um, tiny URL there for you to do your voting on the startups that you feel should be champions, the ones who should go home, and the ones who should start a consulting job. So feel free to put in comments there as prescribed by Mike. Um, and the judges will convene on their criteria and their rankings. In other news, for the soccer fans in the house, 
Copa, Real, Copa del Rey match coming up, Barcelona and Villarreal. First leg, three to one. Second leg, we don't know. If you are a Villarreal fan, this is your time to leave the building and never come back. All right, guys, so um, can I invite all the startups to come up on stage, please? Not, not all, sorry, just for today's session. So you guys. <laughs> the eight startups for today's session. And then the judges that's come up here, so what we're gonna do right now, guys, finish up your voting. We're gonna try to see if we can get the data in. If not, we're gonna send out an email for audience awards. We're gonna announce first uh, the, the winner for today's session, and then we're gonna invite all the startups for all the three-day sessions on stage for family picture as well as uh, staff from Mobile Capital, all the, our lovely helpers and volunteers and staff, and uh, so it's going to be a giant mess in, in about 30 seconds. So first of all, um, we need to announce the winners. So, um, Stefan? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> so, big sign here Yep. for the winner. Okay, so we're going to do, and so the runner-up. For the third day of four years from now, Digital Media Awards goes to Toy Mail. And last but not least, the winner of the third day, four years from now, Digital Media Award goes to Photomath. Okay, judges coming up for, for, for the pictures. You guys should go over there. Have our judges <laughs> join us, please. Flank to the right and to the left. All right, and we actually have the result. Thank you guys for voting. We have 200, well, 70 people that voted in the audience today. The audience award for today's award goes to Toy Mill. Okay, awesome. At this point, can I invite all the starters to come up and the volunteers? We actually have a, a sponsor prize for everybody that participated in this year's award. Uh, there's a Lenovo, I believe, a tablet device uh, that's going to be given out to all the startup teams that participated. Um, so, guys, coming up, all the <laughs> and all the startups. Let's uh, yeah, it's going to get crazy right about now. 